don't know. I don't think, you know, you just... You know, this guy, I mean, my whole life was with this guy, and, you know, for the viewers of Anton Paris' show, this is Susan Blonde, back with you after quite a long absence. And this is a really exciting interview that we're going to have, we hope. Um, this is Meatloaf, and this is Jim Steinman, the guy who writes all the songs. Now, seeing that we are in New York for this part of it, you know, I mean, you have heard, you cannot live in the city without having heard Meatloaf on radio, on NEW, on all the stations. And NEW was voted the best new artist of the year. And um, in the Post, it was one of the top ten, I mean, everywhere you look. So, all of you uh, should know about this guy. You, know, you probably saw him at the bottom line, or you're going to see him at the Palladium, or probably he'll be playing... Hey, Susan? Yes? Uh, we've got noise from the machine. Yeah. Uh, That's all right. How much? Lots. It's like a real heavy hunger. Can we, uh... Okay. Oh, okay, we're ready to go again. Uh, Alrighty, right. Just set it here, babies. What? Shoot it, shoot your shot. You shot it. Okay, we, we already did that, let's see, can I edit that? Um, okay, now, so all of you... Wait, for the rest of this is for the rest of the country, and I didn't finish the thing for New York. Turn, you can turn the other thing off for one second, because I have to end the rest of New York for one second, okay? I'll just say the end of New York, and then I'll say the rest, okay? Then I'll do the introduction for radio. Okay, so all of you in New York must know who Meatloaf is, and, and if you don't, you can come and see him at the Palladium or uh, the Met or wherever he's going to play next, probably Palladium on March 4th. And, um, so, I get read a lot of bad American, so this is, this is the real him, and we're going to show you a movie that you're going to see what it's like to see him live, although, even the greatest movie in the world, and I think it is a really great movie, is not really what it's like to see in life. Okay, now, now, now the beginning for regular radio. You okay. got it. Okay. Okay, hi. Uh, this is Susan Blonde, and I'm here with uh, two of the all-time greats in my book, and I think in yours, too. Uh, this is Meatloaf. Hello, Susan. And Jim Steinman. And, uh, it, I guess all you know, but if you don't, Jim Stein is the guy who writes it all. And, uh, he plays the piano on stage, and, and he, it's, you know, his mind is sort of created, and it's through me love that it sort of came alive, actually. It's quite a team. That's right, Steinman has been dead for about five years, and, uh, you know, uh, due to the fact that he's been dead and I'm still alive, you know, it's recreated that way. Good, Susan, good, come in. Now, uh, one thing about them, all right, first, seeing them on stage, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have heard their record, but seeing them on stage is just about like the most, I mean, I've almost had a heart attack a few times. Now, I'm not the only one that's like this. Right, you're not the only one that's almost had a heart attack several times. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I was going to say, did you meet, if you meet gets to this intensity, that people have said, a lot of people said to me, they said to me, I'm sure they said it to Jim, that they think he's either going to have a heart attack or they think he's going to die. They think, because it's so intense that it's like, they say that only have they seen it before, in Elvis Presley or in Janis Joplin. And I've heard that. I mean, those are the two that, have, that I've heard about. So, do you ever think of what it would be like to actually, I mean, thinking about fantasy, seeing that so much of the Die on stage? That, to die as you were like... Well, as, I say, as, I, as I've been known to say before, the king died in his house. I'm going to die on stage. I think it's good for at least six million records. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I'll leave Steinman all my royalties, and uh, Steinman will get rich, you know. As I said in the record world, I'm a rock and roll mutation in a race with death. <laughs> Can't fail. Two things that never fail in show business are dying on stage in a kick line. That's right. Kick line's much harder for him than death. That's right. Me and Simon tried to kick line once. Wow. He's he was always on, off. He's always a beat behind. So I to our vaudeville act, you know, back in the twenties. Yeah, what? He was a beat behind. He wrote great material, but he was off, you know. I mean we should have been superstars in the twenties. But uh, he blew it, you know. And when I was Henry the Eighth, you know, I had his head cut off. Cause he was Anne Boleyn. 
It's not really been together down through the centuries. Yeah, that's what I think. I think it's not. Like some people say that this is sort of like some 1950s, and, and a lot of it is, or 1960s growing up, and, and I feel a lot of that, but I think that, that the romance of it and all is like through the ages. Oh, it is. I'm, I was Henry VIII, he was Anne Boleyn. I'm totally convinced of that. My road manager and I were both slaves who escaped the South. Uh, it was my plan to escape, but then Simon in the 20s, we had a vaudeville team. He wrote great material. We were really funny. The only reason we didn't make it, he was always a beat late. I couldn't believe it. I got so mad at him all the time. He was always a beat late. You know, so now we come back around. This time, you see, he just keeps his mouth shut. He writes the material. He arranges it. You know, he lets me take it on the stage. And it works out well that way. You know, I have to yell at him about his gloves. Let's talk, you see his gloves. Oh, you can't see, because we, see, we're doing two things at once. You know, let me tell the radio what we're doing. We got a video camera going here, and we're also doing a radio thing at the same time. Well, for those of you who can't see, he has on a pair of uh, black leather motorcycle gloves, which look like Darth Vader from Star Wars. And uh, he's sitting now. Simon always wanted to be a leader of a motorcycle gang. And uh, this is his image, which he wants to portray. His uh, passport from 1968, he looks like a skinny leader of a motorcycle gang. And uh, he looks like a motorcycle gang leader now, only he's not mean enough to do it. But other than that, he's very dangerous, dangerous individual. Anybody who's quiet is very dangerous. I get scared of you sometimes. Dangerous. I do. Well, that's valid. And for those of you who can't see, we're all sitting here and like probably during the thing that the, the show that we're doing for uh, TV is very like, um, has no censoring at all and uh, it's called public access. Uh, so we might do some really, really crazy things, but none of you can't see. That's, that's right. You, never you know. hear a few noises or anything. Crazy. That's crazy. what it is. That's right. And, and Susan is famous apparently for her public access uh, television. Uh, for uh, taking off her clothes. Not all of them. Not all her clothes. Only her top. And if Susan will take off her top, so will I. Simon will take off his gloves. That it's like a bad game of strip poker. And, and it was semi-public access. <laughs> semi-public access. And it was always part of the plot. It was never just for the sake of it. Right. It's like I love it. Sick, right? Because I mean, I love. I Simon and I are not lovers. Oh. That's uh, that's a fact, you know. Well, we're trying to get across time and our night lovers, even though the songs are romantic. And that they're so sexy, right? Cause this well, look, yeah. Susan, the songs are more than romantic. The songs are, let's, we can sum it up pretty easily, yeah. the songs are. The, the songs are rock and roll in the truest sense, which means they contain certain elements that have to be in rock and roll, which have been missing from most rock and roll for the last few years, because there hasn't been much rock and roll for the last few years. And they contain, for one thing, they're feverish, they contain yeah. fever. Yeah. They contain fantasy, not the whimsical kind of granola fantasy of Genesis or Yes or any of those organic groups that fly away with their own little dreams. They contain fantasies that are rooted in passions and rock and roll mythology. They contain violence and romance. And they contain violence and romance to the point where the two intersect, where you have romance that's so obsessive and desperate and urgent that it becomes violent. You have violence that's so heroic and so felt and so fantasized that it becomes romantic. So you have romance with an undertone of violence and violence with an undertone of romance. And when those two collide like two motorcycles, the motorcycle of romance, the motorcycle of violence, and they crash, then you get that chord in the backbeat of rock and roll in the same sense that when fever collides with fantasy or rebelliousness with fun. I mean, if you take those six elements, fever, fantasy, romance, violence, rebellion, and fun, you got rock and roll, right? And if they're all like these choppers that are demolition derby and they're all crashing into each other one after the other, then you get rock and roll, all the chords of rock and roll. And what we really try to do in the album was get all those things to collide. The romance with the violence, you can put them in any combination, the fever with the rebellion, the fun with the fever, the fantasy with the violence. And that's what I think is in it. And, and that's what's the strong why it's constantly intermingling the violence with the romance. And uh, that's what, for me, it has been rock and roll a long time. I mean, there's no violence in Peter Frampton. There's possibly no blood in Peter Frampton. There's no, there's no fantasy in Peter Frampton. There's, there's none of that stuff. A lot of that stuff in Fleetwood Mac. You're not going to find fever in Fleetwood Mac. There's going to be elements of that missing for me in all of the groups in the last few years. And so what we really try to do is get an album that had those things and that could be ignited by all of those elements colliding with each other. 
And I think if there's a power in the album, it comes from those sacred elements. It's like alchemy. I mean, rock and roll takes those things and turns it into something sacred. So I, I would say that then kids, or I mean, any of us to listen to it, that's why um, you've become sort of like our idol, because we've probably been well, that's looking like, for things. That's why they like anthems. Yeah, that's why it's like an anthem, because we've been looking for something to believe in and to